and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, we have a lot of people here from all around the world. Uh, I want to thank uh, all the great speakers uh, that have uh, joined us. Uh, for me, it's a dream come true to be with the three uh, speakers, uh, including uh, Dr. Brian Drucker, who has uh, always been our hero, and uh, we'll hear it later in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, so I'm really excited and uh, nervous. And before I, uh, st we start uh, the presentation of the great speakers, uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining. And, uh, all, and uh, first of all, I want to dedicate this uh, webinar, special webinar, uh, which celebrates uh, 20 years from opening of the IRIS trial, which was the first trial that uh, imatinib or STI or GLIVE, call it whatever you want, was approved. Uh, for treatment of CML patients. And it's also a personal story for me for 20 years. I want to dedicate it to all the CML warriors that we have lost along the journey in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and especially to two close friends of mine. The first one was a patient of uh, Dr. Brian Drucker. And uh, that's Zavi Miller uh, from Canada. He was a very close uh, friend of mine. Uh, they used to call him and me the drug smugglers because we used to send drugs all around the world. We collected from patients drugs they didn't need, and we send if there are a few patients in Iran who like Israel, that's because they received some imatinib uh, from us uh, many years ago when it was not available. And he was also the Zero Club uh, he, uh, establisher. And that's every CML patient who reached zero or close to zero, he gave him a number. And that's really uh, gave a lot of hope for many uh, patients at that time, uh, 20 years ago, it was uh, not, not clear uh, like today. And I'm really proud to be number 50 uh, on the Zavis uh, Zero Club. And uh, then uh, the second one is Israeli CML patient. Uh, he was a member of our board. Uh, he was an accountant. He was in charge uh, of uh, the auditing uh, of our uh, patient organization. And he uh, actually tried all TKIs which were available. And uh, he was either resistant or intolerant to all five of them. And he, at the end, went to a bone marrow transplant, which extended his life for five more years. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away last year. And we lost him. His name is Menachem Kazanovsky. So they are very good uh, friends of mine, but they all re only represent a lot of the patients uh, from all around the world. So without further ado, I want to start a webinar and the presentation, and I invite uh, Professor uh, uh, Pierre Anani to open uh, this meeting and tell us what was CML like before 2000? Uh, what was the story of CML patients uh, before we had uh, the big change uh, started? Professor Pierre Anani is the head of the hematology department in uh, Bellinson uh, or Rabin Hospital in uh, Petah Tikva near Tel Aviv. It's a big, a very big uh, center. She's also the leader of the Israeli hematology CML working group. And she has been the medical advisor of our local CML patient organization from the beginning, almost 19 years ago. So it's always a pleasure having you with us, uh, Professor Anani, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Giora, and thank you very much for giving me this kind opportunity to share this day with you and with these great speakers. So good evening, everybody. During the next 10 minutes, I will take you through the journey of CML during the decades between 1960 and 2000. Alongside this universal journey, I will tell you about my personal own CML journey in the pre martini era. In 1960, Peter Noel and David Hungerford discovered and described the Philadelphia chromosome. This was a real quantum leap of an abnormal small chromosome 22, which turned out to be the most significant milestone in the journey of CML between 1960 and 2000. Here you can see the two scientists, Noel and Hungerford, with their publication in the medical journal Science in 1960. In this slide, you can see the major milestones in the unraveling of the biology of CML and its treatment. In 1960, the Philadelphia chromosome, a minute 22 chromosome, was discovered, as I said before, by Noel and Hungerford. During that period, CML patients 
were treated with chemotherapy pills like busulfan and hydroxyura. In 1973, Janet Rowley found that the Philadelphia chromosome is a result of a translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. That's why we celebrate today the CNN patient today. While in the 80s, the molecular basis of the BCRA diffusion gene was established and treatment with interferon and bone marrow transplantation was introduced. During the 90s, the biological meaning of the fusion gene as a causative factor for CMN was established, and the first clinical trials with terzinkinase inhibitors were initiated, culminating in the Irish Phase 3 clinical trial that set the stage for the fast track approval by the FDA in 2001 of imagine as first line treatment for CMN. In this slide, you can see the historic development of CML therapy. As you can see, between the 60s and the turn of the century, treatment moved from chemotherapy pills like busulfan and hydroxyura to bone marrow transplantation and very high doses of interferon alpha. Patients were bedridden either due to the very high doses of interferon or post bone marrow transplantation. Both were associated with a relatively high rate of mortality and morbidity. To summarize the main differences between CML before and after 2000, I will highlight the following issues. Before 2000, CML was a fatal disease with poor prognosis, while currently it is regarded as indolent with excellent prognosis. While interferon improved median survival from three to six years to nearly seven years, nowadays patients with CML have the potential to survive for decades. Imatinib has replaced interferon and allogeneic stem cell transplantation as frontline treatment. And in the past, there were very few second line treatment options available, while now more powerful tyrosine kinase inhibitors can overcome resistance to imatinib. In this slide, you can see data taken from the MD Anderson Cancer Center database. You can see here the survival curves for CML patients over the decades between 1965 and post 2000. One can easily see the improvement in the five and 10 year overall survival over the years, rising from less than three years median survival in the 60s and 70s to seven years and more in the 80s and 90s, and nearly normal overall survival of patients beyond 2000 with the growing use of terosine kinase inhibitors. In the time left for me, I will share with you my own personal journey with CML. Like the Philadelphia chromosome, I was also born in 1960, but not in Philadelphia, but in Tel Aviv. I went to medical school in the 80s during the years that bcr able chimeric gene was discovered. In 1992, <clears throat> while being a resident in internal medicine, I published my fourth scientific paper entitled Life-Threatening Hypophosphatemia in a Patient with Philadelphia Chromosome Positive CML in Acute Plastic Crisis. At that time, treatment for CML consisted of interferon and bone marrow transplantation with a median survival of seven years. I will never forget my CML patients whose quality of life was very low, many of them being bedridden, depressed, interferon and bone marrow transplantation. In those years, CML was considered a very frustrating illness to treat for a young doctor as myself in those days. In 1995, I was sent for a postgraduate course at the Hammerson Hospital in London. This was a turning point in my career. This course was moderated by Professor John Goldman, who was the guru of CML and the mentor of many future leading figures in the field. After that summer course, I knew that this is what I want to practice in, though in those days, CML was not a very attractive disease for a young physician launching on her medical career. In January 1996, Professor John Goldman and his group came along with many other rising stars in the field of CML to a CML meeting organized in Jerusalem by the late Professor Rachmilevich. Among them was a young oncologist from Oregon, 
Dr. Brian Drucker, who presented his early results with STI with a with STI 571, later called imatinib or glibit. And here you can see his name and the title of his talk in 1996. During that meeting, Professor A. Goldman also introduced me to Nick Ross, uh, who became my direct supervisor in the MRD lab at Hammersmith between 1996 and 1997. The clinical rounds in the CML department at Hammersmith during those days were rather depressing, but the good place in the West End in London compensated for this. Here you can see Professor Goldman, Nick Ross, and myself. During the following years, I was treating CML patients with either high doses of interferon or bone marrow transplantation, facing the dilemma whether to offer them the single curative treatment at that time, namely bone marrow transplantation, with a chance of 30% mortality, or continue with high doses of interferon, which could offer them a median survival of seven years. In 1999, I participated in this 41st ASH annual meeting in New Orleans. I will never forget this cold winter day when we listened to the talk given by a young oncologist, Dr. Brian Brooker, about the new drug, STI-571. We all had goosebumps when we left the uh, hall. We felt that it was a real revolution in the treatment of CML and an important milestone in the treatment of cancer in general. In 2001, STI-571, later called imatinib, was approved by the FDA for the treatment of CML first line. Two years later, I joined the CML support group headed by Giora, and since then, our passes have never parted. I would like to conclude on a personal note. I started my career as a resident in internal medicine in 1988. One of my patients named YZ was treated with hydroxyurea for CML and developed plastic crisis manifested by hypophosphatemia. This was my fourth medical publication. I was then lucky or unlucky to treat patients with interferon at very high doses with a median survival of seven years. Quality of life of these patients was very poor. CML patients' fate changed dramatically in 2001 with the introduction of imatinib into clinical practice. During the next decade, CML patients went through a fascinating journey with the changing image of CML from a fatal disease into a potentially curable one. I feel I was lucky to be part of this journey, which is still ongoing, and I'm lucky to share my personal CML journey with you today. So I wish you a very nice and interesting evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pia Vanani. Uh, it really was a nice description of what it was like uh, to have CML in the, uh, before 2000. And uh, now I'd like to share with you uh, just a short story of myself, uh, CML, and actually uh, uh, my story is reflecting the revolution that happened in the CML in the last uh, 20 years. So I was diagnosed with CML, uh, which was a big shock for me. I was 48 years old in February 2000. It was just after the millennium has changed. And I was sure that the computer has made a mistake. If you remember all the concern we had about computers changing the, to, from year 1999 to 2000. But unfortunately, it was not. Uh, I went to three experts in Israel, top experts. Each one of them gave me a different treatment plan. And I was lost. And I started searching the internet uh, and tried to find my way. What do I want to do? Uh, I found a first chat group of CML patients uh, in the beginning of 2000. And then we joined uh, those who remember at that year, uh, Susan McNamara. She was a CML patient. I think it, she was also a patient of uh, Dr. Brian Duke, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, uh, the STI uh, was being developed uh, by Novartis, but all the 
uh, the people who are involved in developing this for telling the uh, CEO of Novartis, Dan Vazella, that uh, it's not worth to develop it. There are too many few patients, it's not worth economically, and they should not spend so much money. And there, there were hesitation whether to develop uh, further this drug or not. And I'm sure that we'll hear much more about this from uh, Dr. Professor Brian Drucker. Uh, and then uh, we wrote a petition uh, to Dan Vazella, the CEO of Novartis. Within a few days, we raised 4,000 signatures. The petition came to his table. There were also many people who came to him and asked to continue. And he decided at the end against all the recommendation to, to develop the drug. And that's, that was the big uh, change. Uh, you can read all this in the book he wrote later, which is called The Golden Bullet. Uh, I was waiting uh, to join the IRIS trial to open, and actually I was in touch with Dr. Professor Brian Drucker. I already made all my plans to go to Portland, to Oregon. I spoke with a local rabbi. I organized school for my four children to make sure they can go, and I was planning to go there for about a year. Uh, unfortunately, the, the trial did not open in uh, Portland, Oregon, and I ended up through the internet finding uh, the IRIS trial opening in Germany, and I was lucky to join a trial with another great doctor, Professor Hochhaus uh, from Germany, who is still my uh, doctor until uh, these days. Yeah, I was randomized to the interferon and RC, always asking myself, why do I have to fly to Germany to get interferon when I can get it in Israel uh, free? But uh, after seven months, uh, I was uh, switched uh, to the STI 571 on 14 of February 2001, and that actually became my uh, second uh, birthday. Uh, imatinib or STI worked on me amazingly. I became PCR negative within nine months and I kept this the deep molecular response for, response for 13 years. And in June 2014, uh, with the pressure of my doctor, uh, I stopped imatinib to see if I'm cured. And now I'm more than six years on TFR with my deep molecular response MR5 kept in all months in all the PCRs that I'm doing every few months. And because of all the hesitation I had and all the lack of information, I decided to use my experience and help other CML patients, both in Israel and also globally. So the skies, of course, of CML have changed from very cloudy to blue, but you can, we all know that they are not completely blue and there are still clouds in the sky when we talk about CML. There are still challenges for CML patients today. I just list few of them. One of them is a non-adherence of CML patients, which is not clear why a patient should not take a drug which is uh, saving his life. But still, we know that about 30% of patients uh, are not taking the drug as prescribed by his doctor. Uh, we know about resistance and relapses uh, that uh, we don't always have the solution to, but it's an issue for some CML patients. A lack of information, for example, uh, pregnancy, uh, how do you treat a young female, a female, CML, a female patient who wants to become pregnant. It's not always clear and not all doctors have a consensus about how to do it. In some countries, there are issues about generics and uh, suboptimal uh, treatment. Uh, quality of life is a big issue for CML patients, uh, and we hear it every day. I hear it from uh, my patients, and uh, many of them suffer, some of them more, some of them less, but it's an issue that we have not still, we have not yet found the solution. And last but not least, access to treatment. Uh, most of us come from Western countries, North America, Europe, and others, and where we have all the TKIs available, or most of the TKIs available, and patients are receiving them and living with the, with the disease. But uh, as part of the leadership of the CML Advocate Network, uh, we are very aware that there are so many countries in the world where there is no access to sometimes not to any TKI, sometimes only to one uh, TKI with no second line. And pa CML patients are still dying in too many countries in the world. And that's an issue that we are working on. So what are we doing both in, uh, nationally and also globally uh, to tackle these challenges? 
Uh, first of all, we are doing research to understand the patient perspective and uh, uh, what the patient thinks. I was uh, lucky enough to lead a team of CML advocates to do two big uh, studies. Uh, the first one a couple of years ago about adherence or non-adherence with more than 2,500 patients from 63 countries all around the world. Uh, and the last one was last year about uh, TFR, patient who stop, uh, to understand the patient's feeling and perspective, what happens to them when they consider both of these studies were published in the scientific magazine. The last one we are very proud about was published in Leukemia only in May this year. Uh, we participate in advisory board with companies uh, to improve access. Actually, this happen, all, happens all the time. And we just had a recent uh, advisory board trying to see how we can help the access in the Philippines. And we have a few other countries on our list. And we work with the companies and mainly with the help of the Max Foundation and Pat Garcia Gonzalez, uh, the CEO, how we can improve uh, access for patients in these countries. Uh, we are today participating in new drug development as members of investigators, committees, and we work together closely with the leading CML hematologist groups like the ICMLF or the EICML. Uh, uh, Professor Salio, I still remember very well the last meeting I participated in Turin when you hosted the EICML meeting a couple of years ago. We are doing educational empowerment uh, for patients uh, to teach them about the different aspects of CML. And uh, I have just released today a, a new TFR short video, which explains to the patients what TFR is and make it in a very visual, easy to understand the concept. And uh, most important, we are keeping the hope of the dreams of the patients. And uh, yes, I myself still have a dream and my dream is to organize a similar webinar like we have today in five years when we all will be able to discuss the cure for CML patients. So I thank all my Israeli patients and also the global CML advocates community for giving me the strength and energy to continue my dream. Thank you very much. So now I would like to invite uh, my hero. I don't know if you remember, Brian, the letter I wrote to you, I think 18 years ago, when we organized a book for you and every and many patients wrote an album with pictures and uh, each one shared his own uh, story and we send it to you as a thank you for uh, actually saving our life. So I'm really proud and I think this is for the first time uh, to host uh, Professor Brian Drucker uh, from uh, Portland, Oregon. He is the director of the OHSU Knight uh, Cancer Institute. And uh, what can I say about uh, him? Uh, he's, uh, we have a Facebook group, which co it is called Brian Drucker is the man. And uh, it has hundreds of CML patients in that group. And uh, really, I'm really uh, excited and honored to have you with us and to listen to your story, how you have developed the drugs that saved the life of so many CML patients all across the world. Please, Brian. Thank you, Giora, for that very kind introduction. And congratulations on your 20 years with CML and six years off treatment. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. And I'd like to start by wishing all of you a very happy new year, Shana Tova. And I wish you all the best for another healthy year. My journey in the developing the first targeted therapy for cancer began as a medical student nearly 40 years ago when I learned about acute leukemia in children. We learned in the 1950s, this was a universally fatal leukemia, often within six weeks or less. And articles written about this leukemia all started by noting the best that could be done was to try to ease the horrible pain experienced by the children with this leukemia. Over the next two decades, this leukemia became routinely curable with combinations of chemotherapy drugs given over two years. As remarkable as that was, all I could think about was there had to be a better way. And in my final term paper, I wrote that only through understanding of what drove the growth of cancer could we develop better therapies. And so my journey began. Of course, I still had three years of medical school left and three years of residency training, followed by three years of training in medical oncology. 
During my oncology training, I grew tired of giving patients chemotherapy. It rarely worked and was always toxic. So I returned to my long held desire to do something different and began working in the laboratory of Dr. Thomas Roberts at Harvard's Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to study how cell growth is regulated. I thought there had to be a better way that we could kill cancer cells without harming normal cells. During the next seven years that I was working in the laboratory, many strides were made. As you heard from Professor Anani, a few threads in CML had come together from Peter Noel and David Hungerford's discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome in patients with CML in 1960, to Janet Raleigh's discovery that it was two chromosomes, nine and 22, exchanging segments to produce this abnormal chromosome, to Rick Van Etten and George, George Daly showing in 1990 that the product of the Philadelphia chromosome, BCR ABLE, caused leukemia in mice. To me, this meant that BCR ABLE caused CML, but most in the field remained skeptical that it was that simple. In the meantime, Alexander Levitsky, working at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, published an eye-opening paper in 1988 showing it was possible to specifically inhibit the activity of enzymes like BCR ABLE that regulate growth. Prior to that, most people thought that targeting this family of enzymes would simply not be possible. During this time, I had forged a collaboration with Nick Leiden at Novartis, one of the few companies working to develop drugs to inhibit this family of enzymes to which BCR ABLE belongs. Nick had sought my advice as I developed one of the most widely used tools to study the regulation of cell growth by this family of enzymes. And in addition to being a researcher, I was also a doctor, treating patients who might benefit from drugs such as these. Even though at the time I wasn't working on CML, in 1988, I told Nick that CML would be the best cancer to test targeting this family of enzymes. But in 1990, I took my own advice and began working on CML with the guidance and mentorship of Jim Griffin. I was beginning to make what I thought were significant strides in my CML research. I had published several papers, mostly as a collaborator. I was feeling pretty good about my work. So I met with the man running Dana-Farber to ask for some lab space and a promotion. He sat behind his desk thrumming, thumbing through my papers. He told me, I didn't have enough independently authored papers, and I didn't have a future at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. But I had a backup. I'd been negotiating with the chief of medicine across the street at Beth Israel Hospital. When I went back to close the deal, I was told the job had been given to someone else with more promise. I was devastated. Two of the most prominent leaders in the field of medicine had told me I wasn't worth the investment. But as I look back, this was a turning point. It was like someone knocked me in the head. I'd gone into cancer research to find a better way to treat cancer. I was tired of giving chemotherapy and had promised my patients I would go into the lab until I found a better way to treat cancer. These events awakened and invigorated my desire to make a difference. It was an opportune time. I believe targeted therapies are the future. Those setbacks gave me focus. I just needed lab space and a fresh start. I accepted a job at Oregon Health and Science University and moved to Portland, Oregon. I had one goal. I wanted to find a drug that worked in my CML disease models and get that drug into the clinic for my patients. I was fortunate to find a wonderful boss in Oregon, Grover Bagby. He said, sometimes the best thing you can do for a researcher is to give them an opportunity and leave them alone. And he did just that for me. Within six weeks of arriving in Oregon, Nick Lydon sent me some compounds that his group had developed that he thought might inhibit b -cerable. I started working with these compounds, one of which killed leukemia cells 
without harming normal cells. I had exactly what I'd been looking for. This compound would later become the drug Gleevec. But at the time, there were huge hurdles. The drug company didn't think it was worth the investment. They thought the drug wouldn't work or it would be too toxic. And worst of all, they thought it would never make enough money to warrant the investment in its development. Nor were they willing to take a chance on an unheard investigator from Oregon. So began a five year crusade to get this drug to patients. Fortunately, I had a few scientific advocates. Professor John Goldman was the first to recognize the potential of this drug. You heard Professor Egmilowitz invited me to give a presentation in Jerusalem in 1996, the first international presentation of my data. And shortly after that, Moshe Talpas joined us. And though I felt abandoned by some people I once respected, there was one group of people who never doubted me, my patients. I'm always amazed at how patients believe in you, even when you're just starting out. Bud Romine was one of those patients who believed in me. Bud was a newly retired railroad engineer. He had been diagnosed with CML, and at age 65, he had few options. He tried interferon, but it didn't work and left him with little energy. He was too old for a transplant. His wife of 42 years, Yvonne, a retired bank clerk, kept a meticulous folder filled with charts of his blood counts. The lines fluctuated dramatically from 15,000 to 150,000. She drew another line at 10,000 for the top of the normal range, something Bud hadn't seen in years. But for Bud, the numbers didn't mean much. He only knew he didn't have any energy. He couldn't play golf, and he often felt too weak just to get out of bed. Bud read a story in the newspaper about our laboratory studies. He contacted me and put his life in my hands. Bud knew the average life expectancy for, for a patient with CML was about five years. And with four years on his clock, he knew his time was running out. Bud put his faith in me and trusted that I would be able to help him. That faith bolsters you. It emboldened me to take on the biggest drug company in the world and get this drug to them. We had tested the drug in the lab and were pretty sure it was safe. But until you give it to patients, you don't really know. Bud was incredibly courageous. He stepped forward and wanted to be the first patient to be given this drug. In June 1998, Bud's wish was fulfilled, and he was the very first patient treated on our clinical trial. Within six months, every single one of our patients had their blood counts returned to normal. Over the next several years, patients traveled from around the world to enroll in our clinical trials, including two from Israel. As you heard from Jora, patients lobbied for faster access to Gleevec in clinical trials, and this helped spur the drug to FDA approval in record time in 2001. For Bud, the numbers, the approval, the data didn't give him the real picture. For Bud, it meant he could play golf, buy a new truck, and spend his winters with his family in California. Now, almost 20 years later, this previously fatal leukemia has a 95% five-year survival. And we can tell patients diagnosed with this leukemia that the life expectancy is the same as anyone else their age. And for some patients, as you have heard, we have been able to stop treatment safely. But we know that Gleevec isn't perfect. Some people's leukemias become resistant to this drug and their leukemia returns. We've learned an enormous amount about what causes resistance and now have four additional drugs targeting B. cerebral and several more in clinical trials that target the main causes of resistance. Other people struggle with side effects, and we continue to strive to find new ways to manage these side effects and to find more reliable ways to get our patients to a point where treatment can safely be discontinued. Our journey with this leukemia is not over but the current ability to treat it is so vastly improved 
that we now consider CML a manageable condition as opposed to a life-threatening illness. I owe the greatest debt to my patients who put their faith in me as we've gone on this journey to find better cancer treatments. I've learned the importance of listening to your patients. Some of the best lessons come from them. Years ago, I said the greatest lesson that they have taught me is the greatest gift in life is hope. But now 20 years later, I've learned that the greatest gift I've been given is seeing what my patients can do with the gift of life. And I just want to share with you what some of those patients are doing. I'll start with this patient on the upper left, the very first patient, or the longest patient continuous on treatment. She's doing things she's enjoying like gardening. On the upper right, this patient, the first patient treated from Italy in our clinical trials, doing what he does, enjoys doing, which is dancing. This remarkable young woman who was diagnosed at age six, almost 20 years ago, She's now at a nurse at our children's hospital and with a couple of months is expecting her very first child. This very close friend of mine who was diagnosed 15 years ago, when he met with me for the first time, he said, all I want to do is to live long enough to walk my daughter down the aisle. He was able to do that a few years ago and now is the proud parent of a, is the proud grandfather of his first grandchild. This remarkable woman, one of the very first patients treated from Australia who traveled to Portland in the year 2000. She then returned to Australia and was selected to be one of the torchbearers for the Olympic Games for the Sydney Olympics in the year 2000. These stories are your stories and it all begins to add up to lots and lots of people who are now thriving, surviving despite a diagnosis of chronic myeloid leukemia. And for me, this is the greatest reward. And for that, I thank you very, very much. Well, uh, Professor Drucker, what can I say? Uh, I hope the camera is not showing the tears on the side of my eyes because it was a really, really uh, moving uh, story. Uh, and um, I don't know if you know, if I ever told you when we met a few times at Ashes, that actually the idea to start uh, the Israeli CML patient organization came when uh, I supported the CML patient in my city, in Natania, uh, Dorothy, I think you remember her, Dot. Uh, she was progressing from a chronic uh, to accelerated phase and there was no solution, and uh, we supported her to go to you and receive uh, STI 571 on compassionate uh, program or early access program, not in a clinical trial. And uh, really, you have saved her life. And uh, if you remember, at the beginning of the trials, where you had the first uh, patients uh, taking STI 571, you used to gather all the patients once a month uh, in the clinic, and uh, talk to them about this new drug. How is it working? What are the effects? What are the side effects? And you had a patient called Judy Owen that was writing a magazine about each meeting. And when Do Dorothy came back to Israel after almost a year, she stayed with you. Uh, she asked me to start organizing meetings like the meetings you used to organize in your hospital for the Israeli CML patient. And that's how our Israeli CML patient was born, with the seven CML patients in the small hospital in Atania. And now it, uh, we have more than 500 CML patients from all over the country. And uh, it's really, the beginning was uh, due to your meeting. So I thank you for that uh, also. So uh, I want uh, now to move to uh, another great friend of mine, uh, Professor Salio, Joseph Salio, always easier for me to say Beppe, so excuse me, excuse me if it's difficult to pronounce Joseph. 
Uh, we met uh, many times uh, in many meetings, and you presented in many of our CML Horizons meetings for the CML Advocate Network, and we, it's always a great uh, pleasure having you with us. We heard how, what was the situation of CML before 2000, and how this has changed dramatically uh, in 2000, uh, when the, with the introduction of uh, SDI 571 in Imagineer. But I think no one of us could have dreamt at that time uh, that there will be one day that maybe we'll be able even to stop uh, the treatment because we all thought that this is a life-threatening uh, disease and where we will have to take a pill or a few pills every day for the rest of our life. But then came the first trials of uh, stopping imatinib steam. And uh, I would like you to tell us about uh, this idea of stopping treatment and how did it come to life and um, all the experience and knowledge that you have about the TFR. Remember, we did a video together when I interviewed you about this uh, TFR uh, story just a couple of years ago. So Professor Salio is a professor of internal medicine and hematology at the University of Turin in Italy. He's one of the world's leading uh, CML experts. And as I said, I heard him present in many meetings, and it's always a pleasure having you with us. So the stage is yours, and thank you for joining us very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jora. And first of all, let me thank, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to participate to, in this very important day for uh, CML patients, because uh, this is uh, just uh, to, have, to speak uh, with persons uh, like uh, Brian, uh, I think that is uh, always an emotion. I would say that uh, I was present in Jerusalem, Brian, when you uh, first presented your data in uh, 1996, as you remembered, in the house of the, uh, in the house, in a hotel near the house of uh, Elisier Rakmilevich. And uh, indeed, uh, already at that point, uh, everyone was really impressed about uh, the possibility opened by this uh, new drug at that time, uh, the Imatinib. But uh, as uh, I would like to remember now, uh, if imatinib and all the, let's say, the second and third generation TKIs were able to control the disease and give uh, to the patients the possibility of an overall survival similar to that of the control population without leukemia, our goal now is becoming just uh, to achieve a real cure. And we call this uh, uh, status uh, TFR, treatment for remission, uh, which is uh, operational cure according to the definition given by John Goldman some years ago, which means that the patients uh, may uh, live without uh, showing a relapse, a recurrence of the disease, uh, even without uh, taking the TKI. So this is something that after a certain number of years becomes a real cure. As you know, the, the story started um, approximately uh, 10 years ago when uh, François Xavier Mahon um, uh, published uh, the first uh, paper uh, concerning this trial, the STEAM trial. And uh, as you uh, can um, uh, see, uh, what was uh, surprising that after an initial period, after the discontinuation of the therapy, that almost uh, a huge number of patients, huge 60% of the patients, indeed uh, show the recurrence of the disease. Indeed, uh, there was a, a plateauing of the remaining cases who were able to persist in a deep molecular response without uh, taking the TKI anymore. So this was the first scientific demonstration where there were all, already anecdotal reports, but this is the world, the first trial really introducing uh, the concept of TFR in the story of CML. And show us that indeed treatment discontinuation is possible. We didn't know how many patients could achieve this goal at the time, which was the denominator, let's say, of uh, the CML patients which were achieving this goal, but at least the concept was uh, established. Uh, after that study, many, many other studies, uh, and this is uh, almost uh, a, an old uh, slides because it was uh, just uh, uh, one year old, more than 50, but so far I think more than 60 or 70 discontinuation studies have been published, 
involving more than 4,000, probably more than 5,000 uh, nowadays uh, patients, and uh, no more with uh, uh, three, four cases of progression have been reported so far. Uh, we are lacking exact, precisely this information. We are trying to establish now the precise registry and to compare the number of progression which occur in patients who are discontinuing the therapy with respect to those who are continuing the therapy. Of course, a similar categories of patients, patients in uh, deep molecular response. But uh, uh, for the moment, uh, uh, what we know that uh, uh, apparently uh, the treatment discontinuation TFR can be considered safe. So it's not dangerous to try to discontinue the therapy. And then a very interesting phenomenon that was uh, explored uh, some years ago by the group of Kim in Korea, as well as uh, more recently, even in Australia, you may see that even after stopping the therapy, some of the patients who are still scoring positive uh, using very sensitive PCR, uh, indeed they show a progressive decrease in one, two, three, four years of the residual leukemic cells. This is based on RNA. So on the expression of the PCR uh, fusion um, RNA, uh, but uh, the same experiments was more recently repeated by the Australian group, as I told you. They did a DNA DNA showing that indeed the leukemic cells not only are in some cases expressing, but also uh, their presence is progressively uh, decreasing until a total exhaustion in most of the patients. These are their experiments. So the conclusion that once that we achieve a very deep molecular response and the, we keep it for a quite long period of time, the progression of the disease uh, or the risk of progression is becoming less and less, almost disappearing with time. And for those patients that after this continuation relapse, as we will see approximately, previously I showed the slide in which they were 60%, but the correct percentage at the moment, as you will see later also, is approximately 50%. Indeed, if they restarted the therapy, in most of the cases, they achieve a gain, almost all the cases, uh, they achieve a gain, not only MMR, major molecular remission, the safe haven, but also again, deep molecular response. This is a very important concept uh, that, uh, of course, uh, tell us uh, that uh, the worst that can happen for patients who are discontinuing the therapy is to have restarted the therapy that they have discontinued uh, before. There is an interesting category of patients uh, that are those that after stopping the therapy are showing again a reappearance of the PCR reversal. But if you do not restart immediately the therapy with TKI, indeed uh, this uh, initial uh, increase is uh, becoming a sort of fluctuation without overcoming the threshold of the major molecular response. And uh, so the, the, from the clinical point of view, this is not relevant. The patient uh, uh, remain in a major molecular response and doesn't need to restart the therapy. It is allowed uh, to uh, increase the threshold of, of, to restart the therapy uh, from uh, the reappearance of the PCR uh, Abelson transcript, so what we call MR 4.5 or even lower, uh, to the reappearance uh, uh, to the, the loss of MMR. And indeed now the loss of MMR is the standard to restart the therapy. There has been uh, a study, another study of the French group recently updated at the ash -TCF, showing that indeed patients uh, that uh, were discontinuing the therapy and uh, uh, did not, uh, were not losing MMR. Uh, in this trial, as you see, were 61%, so a percentage higher with respect to what uh, in, uh, reported in the STEAM trial after five years. You may see that after three years, indeed, there are still some relapses. So uh, the French investigators uh, were curious uh, to study better uh, in a deeper way, this phenomenon. And this is uh, the long-term follow-up of these patients in which uh, after a consistent number of years, 
45% uh, of the patients are still in a, a deep uh, molecular remission. And what they have established, they have distinguished two types of over recurrences. One is uh, an immediate, uh, which is occurring within the first uh, uh, six months, really, but some cases are also occurring during the first and the second year, or those who are uh, late relapses of the disease between two and six years after the stop of the therapy. So this category, precise category of patients. And uh, what they have uh, seen is that uh, those patients who are in a stable molecular remission in TFR without uh, losing or re really occasional increase of the BCR on but uh, which cannot be distinguished from uh, lab, lab uh, this, uh, variation of fluctuation with respect to those who show uh, a fluctuation more pronounced, which are represented in approximately 55%. This patient, this group here, are those who are at risk of losing later on MMR. And there are two messages uh, that we can retrieve from this slide. The first one is though, uh, those who are remaining for a certain period of time in a stable, deep molecular response, indeed uh, are not losing. And probably, uh, sorry, so probably they are entering the category of patients in which uh, the disease, if studied with very sensitive methods, is progressively going down. Uh, the other category of patients with the more unstable a deep molecular response, if you want, they are losing the response, but not in 100% of the cases, as you may see, but in approximately one third of the cases only. And this is important. But what is important is that after a certain number of years, as again, as in, in the, the um, previous slide of the STEAM study, uh, we can consider these patients out of the risk of uh, um, the disease, of uh, recurrence of the disease. And I would say that uh, from the uh, canonical, let's say, conventional point of view in hematology, once the, the disease uh, in the patients is not occurring again after five years, we can consider these patients really cured of the disease. And uh, um, so, Obvious question is uh, the question that in part we didn't answer so far, so which are the patients in which it's possible to try to stop the TKI therapy. There are recommendations. The most recent one is the one published by the European Leukemia to 2010 to 2020 this year. As you may see, there are optimal in which uh, uh, is uh, recommended at least to consider uh, to stop the therapy, duration of TKI therapy for more than five years, more than three years if MR4, and more than two years if MR4.5. And there are, however, other conditions which are mandatory, and in some other cases, you can also consider to try to stop the therapy, even if the conditions are not optimal which is uh, just because uh, you need to stop the therapy for toxic effect, for pregnancy, for other reasons. Among these criteria, therefore, which is the most important, certainly is uh, the, as you see in the, the results of this very important study called Euroski for the number of patients who were studied that uh, were uh, approximately 800. As you may see, it's important uh, to have a quite long treatment with TKI. This is statistically significant. But what is important is more important is the duration of the deep molecular response while receiving TKRs. And you may see that this is highly statistically significant. Whereas the time of TKI treatment before TMR is not uh, really, really important. And so uh, it's not statistically significant. So what does it mean? It means that we need to reach DMR as soon as possible and to keep it as long as possible. So the message is very, very simple. How many patients are falling in this uh, category of patients who are reaching deep molecular response in for a quite period of time? And we know that uh, if we are using uh, in really math, and these are data from the NSTMD trial, which has been recently updated, uh, will be published uh, soon again after 10 years of follow up. Uh, one third of the patient is achieving this goal if treated with imatinib after five years. 
More rapid is the, the achievement of a deep molecular response if we are using a more potent TKI, like a second generation TKIs. Therefore, if we consider, uh, I would say, a scheme just to explain this phenomenon, we may say that we are, we are using imatinib, which is absolutely, let's say, the king, the basic drug, if you want. Uh, we are uh, remaining with some amount of uh, residual BCR ribosom, which is due to the persistence of some subclones, which are less sensitive to imatinib. If you are using a more potent uh, TKI, like a second generation TKI, indeed uh, we are uh, in part overcoming the resistance of these subclones. Therefore, we are remaining with a lower amount of BCR ribosom. How do we know that the decrease of BCR ribosome is strictly correspondent also to uh, the um, rapidity of the response? So there are two concepts, uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. If we are the persons who are responding very fast to the therapy, indeed, uh, I heard previously Jora who said that he was already in deep molecular response after six months only after starting with the imatinib. Indeed, these are those who are major chances to achieve uh, later on a very deep molecular response and therefore the possibility to try to stop therapy with a high percentage of success. This is uh, the optimal response independently from the type of TKI that we want to use. That is the minimum that we want to have if we want uh, to achieve uh, the possibility to try to stop TKR. BCR is on less than 10% after three months, BCR is on less than 1% after six months, MMR within 12 months, and MR4 uh, within uh, uh, 24 months. If we are achieving these goals, it's very likely that, that you will achieve later on a MR 4.5, and after a certain period of years, you can try to stop the therapy. How many uh, are these patients after five years of TKI therapy? This is, uh, I would say, not, um, I would say, uh, these are a scheme which has a deduction from the NSTMD study and uh, published uh, by, um, reported by Andrea Sokao's attach in 2015. If you are using imatinib, as you see, one fifth uh, of the patients, 21.6% after five years. If you are uh, increasing nilot using nilotinib 300 milligrams twice a day or another second generation TKI, we are increasing this, uh, this percentage of patients. And uh, there are two studies that I would like to show to you, which are telling us, uh, uh, however, again, which is the most important goal that we must achieve uh, to try to stop the therapy. One is the nestotridum. These are patients who were indeed treated first line with nilotinib for at least uh, two years. They were achieving MR4.5. They were maintaining MR4.5 for at least uh, one year of uh, uh, additional therapy. And uh, if this was uh, demonstrated with a very stable deep molecular response, they were allowed to stop the therapy. We started the therapy only after the loss of MMR. And there is another study, which is extremely important too, it's called an ester stop, in which patients were initially treated with imatinib. They were responding well, but not sufficiently well to try to stop the therapy which means that they were in between 1% and 0.1% of PCR ribosome. They were not achieving uh, uh, MR4. They were switched then uh, to nilotinib, to the second generation TKI, and they, after achieving MR4.5 on nilotinib, uh, on nilotinib they were um, indeed entered the consolidation phase of one year continuing the lotinib. And then if the, this uh, stable uh, molecular response, deep molecular response was achieved, they were allowed to stop the therapy. As you may see, the curves of this continuation are always the same. So we are always, all the curves that I will show you today are showing that there is a 50% probability of remaining in, in TFR approximately after uh, stopping the TKI therapy. 
which means that in the, independently from the type of, uh, uh, of therapy that you have started with. The only difference is not the time uh, of uh, the MR 4.5 to, to the beginning of the study, not the duration of the nilotinib treatment prior to TFR, but the total duration of the TTI therapy. So what does it mean? It means that probably what is really important is, is to achieve a very deep molecular response and to keep it for a certain period of time that, uh, as I told you, can be at least two years, but maybe a little bit longer if you want, if you want to, to have more chances uh, to achieve probably um, uh, TFR. However, of course, uh, to accelerate this process is good, but uh, it exposes also the, the patients uh, to the risk of a major toxicity. That's why nilotinib, as you know, is associated with a higher increased risk of cardiovascular events, which is not good in particular for elderly patients or for patients who have already the uh, risk of um, um, of uh, uh, cardiovascular events, of developing cardiovascular events. So uh, it's something that should be discussed uh, with your doctor. I think that, uh, however, fortunately in the future, we will have other possibility. And one of the possibility is just uh, to have a new category of inhibitor that uh, we, are, uh, we will see recently in the therapy of CMO, which are different from all the other inhibitors, which are inhibiting as the original imatinib, all the subsequent TKI are not inhibiting the uh, ATP binding protein, but in this case, we are inhibiting the meristillation say, site. Meristillation site is uh, something which uh, blocks the activity of BCR reversion. Of course, you can understand that the, the mutations that can occur can cause resistance uh, to uh, traditional, let's say, TKIs are different from the mutations which can uh, interfere with this other process. And this may say that, that this is a drug which will probably will be very useful to complement the activity of the other TKI. For the moment, it has been tested only as a third line therapy in um, before there were data on the phase one study just to establish the dosage and indeed it was demonstrated that even at the dosage of 40 uh, milligram twice a day of 60 milligram twice a day indeed it was in patients with a very old story of CML uh, it was able to demonstrate a very high percentage of uh, even of uh, molecular responses and even in patients with the 359 mutation. But uh, the most important aspect that these responses were associated with a low degree of toxicity, particularly cardiovascular level. And this is something which uh, uh, can be very, very important uh, to be considered that patients. Mm -hmm. Soon, as I told you, this uh, drug uh, will enter uh, within a new uh, ter is a new TKI therapy uh, for uh, is not called a TKI really is called a stamp which means uh, uh, specifically targeting the uh, Abelson meristillation pocket. However, this uh, stamp drug uh, will enter the the market because in a trial in which was compared the stand line therapy with bosutinib in patients without the 359 mutation. Indeed, with the primary endpoint, very ambitious MMR at 24 weeks, indeed it was demonstrated uh, to achieve this uh, primary endpoint. And therefore, this will probably as be associated with the registration of the drug as third line therapy. However, we are very curious uh, to see the result, to receive the results of another uh, trial, which is adding Ashimimib, as I told you, which is a, a, an optimal drug from the conceptual point of view to be added to the traditional TKI because they are inhibiting, inhibiting two different uh, sides of the Abelson with the imatinib with respect to the, those patients who are remaining in imatinib or those patients which has uh, switched into nilotinib. This is just to see if in patients starting with imatinib, which is certainly the 
most likely, uh, I would say, the most diffused drug for senile therapy around the world. And now, in the vast majority of the countries, is indeed quite cheap because it's become generic, are not achieving the goal uh, of a deep molecular response using this drug. Indeed, imatinib only. Indeed, but the addition of Abelson 001 will be able to improve the deep the achievement of a deep molecular response, and therefore to try to allow. Are we ready to introduce TFR in clinical practice? I will finish with these few slides, saying that uh, indeed uh, we are already doing this in Italy. We recently published uh, this paper, which was an observational uh, trial. Uh, on more than 300 patients who discontinued the therapy. I will go very fast now. Not all of them were in deep molecular response, two thirds, uh, one third in MR4 at least, and two thirds in uh, more than MR4, MR4.5, MR5, or even lower. And uh, the results are exactly similar, as I told you, to what uh, we have seen in the traditional study. There were no progression, no risk of disease, and some of these patients are continuing uh, in TFR. Those who restarted the therapy achieved again uh, at least uh, MMR, but the most of them are again in a very deep molecular response. Again, uh, this is what happened. I don't, don't have time to go deep. Similar data have been recently reported also by the Spanish group, by Hernandez Boluda. As you may see, the percentage here of those patients achieving a successful TFR is even higher with respect to what in Italy. And the most important aspect of the paper published by the Spanish group is that indeed, after this continuation, there was an increase in hemoglobin, an increase in the leukocyte number, the lymphocytes too, the platelets too, uh, the creatinine decrease. So there are there is an advantage just to stop the therapy in terms uh, certainly of quality of life. And maybe I would like you to discuss this point later on, but also in terms of also also safety. There is a withdrawal syndrome, but generally this is uh, not so terrible and uh, it uh, is lasting only for a certain period of time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Asalio. Uh, it's always uh, nice to hear you, even though it's not always easy for everyone to understand. Uh, I'll try to move along, and we have now some uh, time for question and answer. And I just want to relate uh, to the topic of TFR as we see it in CML Advocate Network. Uh, of course, uh, t trying to start treatment is uh, important and it can be a goal of treatment uh, for every patient uh, when he works with his doctor when they consult. But when we look at reality, and we saw this reality in the, st in the survey, uh, the study we did among uh, CML patients in 68 countries, we saw that because of the lack of monitoring in many countries around the world, and you cannot stop treatment today if you don't have access to a reliable monthly PCR testing. And that's mainly available in countries like Western Europe, North America, Australia, Japan, Korea, but in most of the world, South Africa, in, in Africa, in South America, in Asia, in most of these countries, patients don't have access to such reliable PCR. So they don't have the uh, ability even to try to stop. So TFR is important, but for us, as I said, Q is much more important because if we calculate how many patients are stopping today, uh, even in the trials that uh, are running, uh, we see about 25% or 30% of the patient can stop. But that relates only to the patient in the Western countries. If we take the whole CML population, we are talking less than 10% of the CML patient. And that's not enough. So as I say, uh, for the CML community patient, we really want to try to achieve cure. And uh, that's why CML Advocate Network uh, is planning uh, to do next month in October a scientific uh, community advisory board 
with uh, about eight uh, scienti scientists who are working uh, on different approaches uh, to try to find cure for CML. And together with about uh, 20 patient advocates from all around the world, we'll sit uh, for a few hours, uh, of course, on Zoom this time and try to explore and see how we, the patient community, can support the investigator to drive forward uh, the approach to find the cure. And hopefully uh, we'll uh, achieve that. And uh, if I already there, and we move now to Q and A's, and I apologize on the on behalf of Professor Pianani, who has another webinar coming at 7:30. She'll have to leave us, even if we continue for a few more minutes. So on her behalf, I apologize. Uh, so the question is, and to all uh, three of you, uh, you CML is one of the diseases we know molecularly best from all the other cancers. It only has one mutation, uh, and uh, that's why it was maybe easier to find the first targeted therapy uh, to treat the, the disease. What makes it so complicated to eradicate the disease? What makes it so complicated to eradicate the stem cells, the leukemic stem cells uh, that are existing? Uh, wh wh why is it so difficult to, to continue to the direction of a cure? Maybe we start with you, Dr. Drucker. Yeah, great question. If if you if I knew the answer to that, um, I, <laughs> I would I would get that into clinic as quickly as we could. I, the reality is is that you know, if you go back to some of the things I said earlier, it probably has to do with CML isn't perhaps as easy as we think it is. We certainly know the growth of the leukemia cells is driven by BCR able, but perhaps the survival is dependent on other factors that, that preceded BCR able. So maybe it's not just a one gene abnormality. Maybe there really are other things, or maybe we even have some data from my laboratory that if you shut down the enzymatic activity of BCR able, the stem cells still can survive. So maybe there's more to BCR able than just the enzyme activity. So it, to me, it's a little bit more complicated and it's also complicated because trying to isolate these cells from a patient in a deep molecular remission when it's a very small fraction of their, their stem cell population and trying to study them and comparing to them to normal stem cells is a really hard scientific problem, but a critically important problem as you, as you described. Okay. Thank you. Anybody wants to add anything, uh, Professor Salio or Professor Anani? Uh, Pia, please. I will after after you. I don't think after what uh, Brian said, I have much to add. I just remember again the late Professor Goldman talking about the dormant compartment, but uh, maybe TKIs do not reach it. Uh, so it might be that uh, still maybe the only Real curative treatment would be bone marrow transplantation, but of course we don't want to pay the price. So, uh, and he also, again, I can only quote him, he used to talk about operational cure. So maybe we can live in peace with this small amount of cells with TKIs or without TKIs. Um, but Beppe, I'd like to hear you. <laughs> no, uh, I think that uh, you are perfectly right. I think that uh, the eradication is difficult, but certainly not impossible. The only system that we have to eradicate uh, the, the chemical stem cells, uh, let's call it this, uh, is uh, just represented by bone marrow transplantation, thereby all bone marrow transplantation, thereby by the possibility of an immunological control of the residual leukemic cells. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, using TKI, what we are doing we are masking in part uh, the, it, we are not, uh, we are killing certain progenitors of the leukemic stem cells, but on the same time, uh, we are indeed uh, masking the stem cells because we are inhibiting the BCL ribosome. So we are making them very similar to a normal stem cells. And therefore this is uh, something that probably will require also not only TKI therapy, but something in addition. This is something similar uh, to what uh, Brian was uh, previously saying, that probably uh, we need uh, to discover something which is uh, preceding or facilitating or, um, in, in, I would say, changing uh, this, 
the, the CMS themselves in a way to be recognizable by the immunological system again. So the phenomenon of uh, the eradication of the leukemia stem cells is still a big, uh, I would say something that certainly we, uh, it needs more uh, exploration, more um, is a challenge for all of us because if we understand these concepts, probably we will be able to cure not only CML, but most of, at least all the myeloid leukemias. Thank you, uh, thank you all. We have here in the, I don't want to start reading all the applauses and all the thank you that uh, you have, uh, speakers have received, uh, and especially for you, Dr. Drucker, for the life saving of so many patients and the participants here. Uh, but hopefully I can gather them and send it to you by mail uh, later. We have a parent to a child which was diagnosed with CML, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And he's asking if you can say a few words about uh, the treating uh, children with CML, is there a difference between treating an adult or treating a child with uh, CML? Does any, do you want to take the question or? Okay, uh, I think that uh, of course the disease in children is uh, particularly challenging because we need uh, um, not only for the, the I would say because we are facing the same difficulties that we are facing in other patients, but also because with the TKI therapy, we are, we are, we are in part interfering also with the, uh, the growth of uh, these children. So we must be very careful. However, they respond uh, to the same drug. There are, we are using, uh, in most cases, imatinib, and there are also trials in which uh, we are able to achieve at least the control of the disease after a certain number of years using in a after TKI therapy, using interferon in, in, in combination with TKI and also in part some successful discontinuation has, has been achieved. So this is a little bit more ch uh, challenging uh, because uh, certainly we have to deal also with the problem of the toxicity, which can be more important for children with respect to what we have for adult patients. Therefore, we do not want to use very, very potent TTKI with a high degree of toxicities because um, I think that uh, this uh, could, uh, in, uh, I would say, in a certain sense, uh, uh, change a little bit uh, the perspective of their developments. So we must be very careful. But there are many trials now ongoing which can answer this question. And the survival of the children and patients is good in our days too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ipia, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I want to say that uh, I think we can take it even to a broader range. I think that uh, when we think about uh, patients, we should think about what is the purpose of the treatment and treatment should be age adjusted. Just if we look at the opposite side, for example, the purpose for an elderly patient, an elderly patient are difficult than those for middle age or, or young patients. So I think first of all, we should think what are, are the aims of the treatment. And for a child, it's as we've mentioned, not to disturb growth, uh, thinking about the future, uh, stopping, uh, the option of stopping. Um, uh, and yes, a child is not just a small uh, old pa uh, patient, it's, you know, it has its own right. Okay, thank you. I have a question of mine to you, uh, Brian. Last time I saw you, I think it was a couple of years ago at ASH, uh, I think uh, was it was at New Orleans, if I'm not mistaken, where you presented uh, the, the plan of uh, beat AML and the plan that you are participating, trying to find solutions for the more difficult uh, leukemias, uh, acute myeloidic leukemia, and uh, there's uh, really a very uh, big plan trying. Where, do you think that uh, the progress that you will be making with uh, treatments for AML, will that be also suitable for uh, blast crisis, uh, myeloidic uh, CML patients? Yeah, so thank you. I, first of all, I wanna make sure that people recognize that I still have a significant lab effort in CML but as one of my colleagues said to me at a, at a conference, um, CML was a stupid disease, um, and I didn't take that personally. He was really trying to say what you said earlier, that it's a much simpler disease. So I have put some lab effort into a much more complicated disease, AML, 
which is very similar, as you note, to, to CML blast crisis. Uh, and certainly many of the things that we're learning about the treatment of a AML could be, could be used to treat blast crisis CML. But fortunately, blast crisis CML is a pretty rare occurrence these days. And, and Beppe and, and Pia, I wonder how often you're seeing it in your clinics, but uh, I, I see it pretty rarely. And that's quite fortunate because it was an extremely difficult leukemia to treat. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question uh, may be for you, uh, Professor Salio. It's an uh, Israeli uh, CML patient, 41 years old. She lives in the U.S., in Florida. And she said it took her 22 months to achieve 0.099 uh, PCR, which is a uh, less than optimal response. Uh, it's like basically MMR after almost uh, two years. And she was asking, would you recommend uh, to try TFR if in, if in the future she is able to maintain deep molecular response for at least three years, even though the speed of uh, the decline of the PCR was uh, slower, not optimal. Uh, I think that uh, certainly, but uh, I would say um, if she maintains a very good uh, deep molecular response for at least two, maybe better three years, I think that is possible to try to stop the therapy in the, this specific case. Of course, there are always uh, patients who are responding very slowly, but uh, this takes more time. But what is more important is the length of the deep molecular response that you achieve. So if then uh, in a few, let's say one or two years, we will have the possibility to use of uh, one of the new possibilities that we are developing now to achieve a deeper molecular response, which means maybe a shimimib or another drug, uh, this is another possibility. So I'm sure that uh, most of the patients that at the moment, you are perfectly right when you are saying that we are discussing about uh, uh, Western countries, uh, most of the patients uh, do not have uh, the possibility of monitoring the disease and so on. But uh, I'm sure that if, even if this represents only a small proportion of the uh, number of the similar patients in the world, however, the experience that we are doing will at a certain point, uh, uh, allows us to uh, allow to, uh, to 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 extend the possibility of TFR. I hope in a let's say a reasonable future, let's say ten years, to most of the similar patients. So please resist. Be patient and resist. Okay. Uh, I think we have some questions that were. The... I would like to do some kind of a case study, a case story, and share with you the speakers. It's really a patient which is very close and dear to my heart. Uh, her name is Michal. I have a daughter named Michal. And uh, she, is, uh, she was diagnosed with CML three years ago when she was 37 years in a routine blood test. Uh, actually, she took uh, imatinib, and uh, even though it decreased in three months to, to, to from 100% to 10% PCR, three months later, it already increased to 30%, so she was switched to the centenib uh, for one year, and uh, the lowest she could have reached with uh, the centenib was 10%, and, uh, but she had a lot of uh, difficult side effects with uh, the centenib. Uh, at that point, her doctor started, uh, to, she did the bone marrow biopsy and found she has a very, very complex cryotype, which uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, she was put on 30 milligrams eclusig, uh, ponatinib, uh, but after less than a week, she developed pan pancreatitis, and she they uh, decreased the eclusic to 15 milligram a day, and they, they started preparing her for a bone marrow transplant. One week before the transplant, she got phenomemia, and after three weeks with 15 mil only after three weeks uh, with eclusic, uh, and her last PCR before the transplant went down to uh, two percent. Uh, she had a very uh, extensive uh, chemotherapy uh, protocol before the transplant, and then she did the bone marrow transplant. Uh, and uh, she's now, I think, nine months or ten, uh, ten and a half months uh, from the transplant. Uh, because the PCR was still positive, 
and uh, after the transplant, uh, they put her back on Eclusig, uh, and she's taking it with terrible side effects, really, really, really difficult. Even though she doesn't have difficult uh, GVHD, the Eclusig is giving her a hell of a time, and she described it, my life is hell. I have very strong uh, bone joints and muscle pain, and I am on 50 milligram fentanyl and 24-7, uh, and still in very uh, pain. Uh, she cannot eat properly. I'm tired all day, but can't sleep properly. I am alive, but without a decent quality of life. Uh, she suggested the doctor to switch the, uh, the ponatinib to busulib, busutinib, uh, but uh, the doctor told her that he thinks the only drug that will work for her after all the difficulties and challenges she had is, is ponatinib, so he doesn't recommend to change. Uh, she suffers, she's hurting, she's on the edge of being desperate, and uh, what uh, can uh, she do at this uh, point of time? Uh, is, is there any solution you can uh, think about uh, you would recommend to such a patient? And I know it's not easy to give recommendation uh, over Zoom and uh, over the internet when you don't know the patient and when you don't see them, but let's try to do your best. What if I can say, is, uh, oh, Brian, please, please, Brian. I, we cannot hear you. You are muted. I'll, I'll chime in after you. <laughs> okay. No, uh, I'm saying that the, certainly the story is, uh, I would say, um, a, a very complicated story uh, because of the transplant, because of the resistance to at least uh, uh, two different uh, TKIs with sensitivity only to the, which is associated with uh, some uh, toxicity and so on. However, the situation at the moment uh, is uh, from the disease point of view is uh, uh, good because uh, the patients uh, has responded very well to, to the inclusive uh, therapy. And uh, therefore, uh, for the moment, I cannot remember exactly which was uh, the response. Can you go down, please, a little bit? You want to this question, to the one we asked? Yes, yeah. It's right here. One. Yes, sorry, Eclusic at the time is the look. And uh, uh, after transplant, six months with Eclusic, and the, the PCR is uh, 0 0.07. So I, will, I would wait to change the therapy until we achieve at least uh, MR4, which means 0 0.01 or less. And then we can also try to decrease the dose of Eclusic. Uh, maybe taking Eclusic uh, every other day and so on. I wouldn't change uh, the therapy because the disease is responding very well in cooperation with the uh, graft versus leukemia effect of the transplant. But I would try little by little to monitor very strictly uh, the, um, the uh, response uh, and therefore the PCR Ibison, trying to decrease uh, the dosage of the drug as much as, as possible without observing a, an increase uh, of the disease. Then to switch for the moment, uh, I think that the doctor uh, is right. It's too early, not the best thing to do. Then we do not know the resistance to bosutinib and so on. So I would continue the same therapy trying to decrease little by little the amount of the implicit uh, dosage. Okay. To try uh, to improve the quality of life. And that's the challenge. Uh, any other comments, uh, Brian? Yeah. So I, I would just, I, first of all, I'm just so sorry that, that she's suffering so badly with, from this leukemia and from the treatments. Uh, I guess I'd start by looking at whether She's off all immunosuppressants, and if she isn't, it's certainly well past day 100, and it's time to, to begin to taper those, and that may actually help the immunological control of leukemia. And I also agree with Professor Salia that generally my approach with this, these leukemias are to try to get the most out of each medication that I can before I switch. Uh, so... Eclusig is working. I would probably, I, I would try to get to the lowest, toler, lowest effective dose possible. If that means 15 milligrams every other day, or even doing what um, is probably not, not supposed to be done, which is to split the tablets and do seven and a half a day. 
uh, again, seeing if that would allow continued control of leukemia. But the reality is if, if somebody's post-transplant and is in a deep molecular response, it also gives you the ability to look at other options. So if Panat or Eclusic isn't tolerable at a low dose, but still has the ability to control, I would be okay trying other medications because you know you can always go back to a Clusi because it would work. Um, as long as you're well below that 0.1 major molecular, um, I feel comfortable trying other treatments. But I say I do prefer to get the most out of each medication before I switch because then I'm not switching back and forth, going from one medicine to another medicine and then not knowing um, whether that's going to be the best best approach. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we'll, uh, we have uh, quite many questions, but uh, I'll try uh, to, uh, to at least to put two more. Uh, one of them is interesting. It's uh, another young CML patient from Israel who has been on nilotinib and uh, he changed to the satinib for suboptimal response. And after three years on the satinib, he reached 0.015% uh, uh, PCR. Uh, he wanted to see if he can stop. His doctor did not recommend him to do so, and he decided not to listen to his doctor, and he did stop treatment. And uh, strangely, uh, without treatment, he became uh, PCR undetectable zero. And this holds now for more than a year, uh, the undetectable. So he's asking, actually, uh, did you see such cases where the PCR goes down to zero without treatment and holds for long? And uh, what is your experience with that? Brian, would you like to start? I, I think Professor Sawyer showed some examples where people who off therapies, PCRs continue to improve. So congratulations. Good job convincing your doctor to stop treatment. And um, I hope that, that it, there's every reason to believe that at this far off treatment, as Professor Sawyer showed, that this should continue. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I would uh, add that uh, we have also some cases who stopped the therapy because of pregnancy when they were only in MMR. Of course, we were um, uh, waiting for loss of MMR to start any kind of treatment during pregnancy, like interferon and so on. And, but indeed, they, they will be in the same situation that, uh, which has been described by these patients. So I think that uh, there are still ma many mysterious uh, things uh, concerning uh, the possibility to overcome uh, the resistance of the residual leukemic cells and uh, to achieve a TFR and maybe a complete cure of the disease. Okay, uh, before I go to the last question of the pregnancy, uh, we have a patient, I think he's the uh, oldest uh, with the most uh, many years uh, in our group. He's uh, almost 29 years uh, CML patient. He was almost nine years on uh, interferon. And then in 2000, uh, of course, he was switched to imatinib. And uh, he's, uh, he's doing uh, well in regards to response even though he had to go up to 600 milligram imatinib. So he's taking a higher dose of imatinib than the regular 400 milligram, but it's keeping his response in an acceptable level. But his creatinine has started to climb and it has reached now 1.65 and he's void. Uh, would you recommend to change imatinib after so many years? And if you change to what, what treatment would you recommend to change? Please, Brian, to you, up to you. Um, I would do able sequencing, see whether there's a mutation and that would help guide my decision. But with the numbers going up, it sounds like it's time to, to make some changes. No, not the numbers. The PCI is not going up. The creatinine, oh. the, the sugar, the creatinine level oh. is going up. And it's oh, reached, oh, it reached 1.65, 1. 1. 1.65. Yeah, and so what's the PCR doing? Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, normal. It's, uh, I think it's around uh, less than MMR. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I, again, for people who are in MMR, you have such an incredible luxury of, 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 of doing things. So, for example, oftentimes in a patient who's well, is MMR or less, and I'm seeing some side effects, I'll give them what I call a treatment holiday. 
I'll stop treatment for four to six weeks, see what their PCR is doing off treatment, see what his creatinine does off treatment. If the PCR goes up and the creatinine goes down, I'd switch to a different drug. If the PCR stays down, um, I just continue to extend the holiday. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I agree with Brian. Okay, sounds a good uh, solution uh, to me for him uh, with so many years with CML. And I think we'll move to the last question, and that's uh, about a female. She was 31 years old when she was diagnosed with CML. She was two years on uh, busolib because she joined the clinical trial uh, of uh, busolib. So she received busolib for first uh, line, and she reached MMR. Uh, after two more years, she has reached uh, MR4. And uh, she wa she had one son before she was diagnosed with CML, but she desperately wanted another child. Uh, so together with the doctor, they tried to stop treatment and see if she can conceive. Uh, she lost her MMR after five months from stopping, and she had to restart uh, busolib. And she regained MMR within two months, and three months later, she regained MR4. So how does she continue now from here? She is 37 years old now and eager for a second child. What uh, are her options? Well, personally, what I think is that uh, for the moment, uh, um, MMR the second time is uh, very, very short. So I would uh, continue for at least uh, some other time taking Bozu, uh, just uh, one, one additional year at least, the better two, but I would say one additional year uh, or O2 could be uh, the, the right solution. Then I wouldn't stop uh, the therapy trying to conceive, but I would try to conceive to be very careful if uh, uh, there is a pregnancy uh, ongoing uh, immediately after, let's say, 15 days or so, um, just, just to be very careful about the timing, because at this time, if there is suspicion, even suspicion, that uh, there is a pregnancy ongoing, it's uh, better to discontinue the TKI. During the first uh, uh, days of the conception, there is no mixture before the formation of the placenta. There is no, no mixture between the, um, uh, the blood, the maternal and the fetal blood, and therefore uh, the embryo blood in this case. And therefore, I would say this is not the dangerous period. The most dangerous period is that starting after the third or fourth week of gestation. And so in this way, uh, as uh, we have already a proof that she was able to maintain MMR for at least five months, we were probably able to get, a, I would say, the period uh, sufficient to restart uh, uh, the therapy uh, uh, after delivery, so without the need uh, to restart the therapy. So I think that uh, in this, uh, this, uh, this can be, but uh, this needs to be done eventually when uh, there is a longer period of reachievement of the MR4. Okay. Uh, I would completely agree with Professor Salio that, again, first of all, longer time in MMR, MR 4.5. I also completely agree that I wouldn't discontinue therapy while trying to conceive, but I would be extremely careful that the day um, you think you might have conceived, do a pregnancy test, if it's positive, stop therapy immediately. But the last point I'd make is that, remember Zavi Zero Club was a complete cytogenetic response. That was a PCR value of one. One percent. Let's not forget that a PCR value of one is still really con well controlled leukemia with a very low risk of relapse. So during pregnancy, I don't feel the need to restart therapy until that PCR gets somewhere above one. And we know during the third trimester that at least imatinib can be used with some degree of safety during the third trimester. So five months to get from off therapy gets you to MMR, that's probably another two or three months to get a PCR value of one. So again, I think you might be able to get through pregnancy after a little bit longer in a deep molecular response. Absolutely, I agree. 
Okay, uh, thank you both uh, very, very much. I really want to thank you, each one and one of you again, uh, Professor Salio, uh, for being again with us. Thank you very much for your great presentation and answer. And of course to you, uh, Dr. Brian Drucker, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I hope this uh, can become a habit that we'll get to hear you now that I know that traveling is an issue for you with children at home and you know how much I try to bring you to CM Horizon, but it was always difficult for you to travel and uh, we understand and appreciate it. But maybe now with the Zoom and the online uh, platform, we can get uh, meet together more often and you can share your uh, vast knowledge and experience with uh, the CM Education community. So thank you again all. Thank you for everybody who has joined us. It was a pleasure having you and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. It was really, really exciting for me. So I wish everyone good morning for you or good evening for the others or good night for the one from the East and uh, hope to see you very much. Have a wonderful C World CML Day. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you, Jora, for, for involving us in this beautiful webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.